This is session number 33 of the Performance Place Sports Care Podcast. I think my voice is getting deeper. Welcome to the Performance Place Sports Care Podcast, where you can learn about sports injury theory, rehab, diagnosis, and how to understand the doctor lingo you didn't understand at your appointment. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez with Performance Place Sports Care Podcast again, and today we have a really great guest who is going to be our expert on knee conditions, mainly with, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about runner's knee as well as meniscus tears. Uh, his name is Dr. Davis Coe, and he is someone I met actually probably about, gosh, I want to say it's probably about six, seven years ago, but actually it was interesting uh, when I started looking up other providers in the area because I like seeing Um, other people who kind of think the same way. And he was one of the only PTs, I think, who had some of the same credentials as me. And I was like, who is this guy? And why does he have so many different degrees after his name? So um, I'll let him speak uh, here in a second. But he's going to go over some of the things that you might ask a physical therapist about rehab on a knee. So this is uh, Davis Coe. Dr. Coe, say hi. Hello. Hey. Okay, so um, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll jump right into the topics. Okay, well, I'm a uh, primarily a sports and orthopedic uh, physical therapist. Been practicing um, over 18 years. The my background also includes working in the cardiac and neuro rehabilitation uh, sections of uh, UCLA Hospital, and also in uh, other aspects of my career in the beginning and then the sports and orthopedic side came as a second half of my career and it gave me a chance to see a broad spectrum of injuries from all different age groups all different causes all different backgrounds and to see the similarities and the differences unique to their situation Mm -hmm. how many years were you in, in cardiac again uh, I was a bit in there about six, seven years and saw a variety of different patients. And again, uh, uh, even from heart transplants to brain injury to working even in the psych ward where we're dealing with people with schizophrenia and, and working around uh, their, their conditions while at the hospital, as well as uh, the pediatrics, and even as young as neonatal. So there is oh, really? neonatal physical <laughs> therapy, if you could believe that. I couldn't even imagine, other than if they had like uh, what spina bifida or some type <laughs> of... Geez, I have no idea what you'd even do with them. Um, so then why did you get into uh, like sports injuries and, and other stuff? Because I know that isn't like for physical therapy, majority of physical therapists, aren't they in... They're not in sports injuries, right? I mean, a lot of them are in, is it home health and... Correct. Yeah. So a lot of them have opportunities in hospitals, neuro rehabilitation centers, uh, skilled nursing facilities. And so a lot of them start that way. They can start that way. I did that on purpose because when I was in physical therapy school, I did want to do sports and orthopedic. And then my sports and orthopedic professors said, well, if you want to do that, go to the inpatient hospital. And I said, why is that? Because you'll get a nice foundational base. You'll appreciate different uh, issues that they may have outside of the injury itself, the importance of where certain medications can affect them out in the, in the when they are out of the hospital, what they're taking, what types of surgeries they did, uh, appreciating the, the development or the after effects of the surgeries from beginning to end. And it didn't have to be orthopedic surgeries. It could be liver transplants. It could be other types of orth, uh, heart transplants, open heart surgery. And you can, and they wanted me to have that type of foundation where you can see all age groups at the same time so that when you do see them in the orthopedic or a setting out in an outpatient clinic, you can appreciate what their, uh, their backgrounds of of uh, hep C or diabetes or they're taking a uh, certain anticoagulant medication or this type and the side effects that may occur and to have a better well-rounded uh, understanding of the patient that's coming in with a knee pain or a shoulder pain. Jeez, I, you, you'd think there's a little less to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, that's, it's funny because, yeah, actually, um, I mean, in chiropractic school, we didn't, I mean, we went through things like blood panels and, like, we learned about, like, systemic or, like, 
organ type of pathology or injury and but we didn't really focus on them that much and like even now like if you showed me a blood panel without the normal ranges i don't think i would yeah i just refer that right out <laughs> <laughs> um so good so yeah good dr ko has a, a large background um so when we go into the topic here uh, i was thinking of mm -hmm. focusing on obviously there's lots of different people who have knee pain but mm -hmm. let's just say we're going to focus on the runner population since it is pretty prevalent and their injuries are a little different than say a geriatric or a 70 80 year old with knee pain right mm -hmm. um so what would be tell me about runner's knee like you know what is it like how often do you see it like what type of person usually comes in with it when i get or do, uh do full force into the orthopedic and sports world uh the Athletes I normally saw were from uh, my time with USA Volleyball, which I currently still work with, or with uh, different sports like um, USA Weightlifting or uh, the pro athletes that have come in through, uh, through the clinic. And what I noticed about the runner's knee is it can happen to a non-runner. So that's one thing that people need to understand that when they say it's runner's knee, it doesn't just happen to runners. It's commonly in runners. It, you know, it got that name from that. But uh, the runner's knee can be in a cyclist. It can be in uh, someone that does a repetitive uh, training or repetitive work uh, related to the knee. And it's become more of a generalized uh, uh, uh uh, more like a generalized uh, symptom or a, like a catch-all term, catch-all right? term, a uh, garbage term for a lot of different causes. So I tell patients, you know, when they come in with certain uh, diagnoses like a plantar fasciitis or whatever, there's about five, six, seven different reasons for that particular heel pain that can be contributing or be the actual cause outside of an actual plantar fascia inflammation. So likewise with runner's knee. Uh, there's a lot of different causes um, and a lot of different backgrounds of the person getting that type of pain. So uh, that's been one thing that I definitely noticed that you can get runner's knee even if you're if you're a volleyball player doing off-season training. You can get runner's knee if and it doesn't have to be the marathon runner per se. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I know <clears throat> we have different uh, AKAs for it as well, which it might confuse people. The uh, the, the patella femoral pain, um, is chondromalacia patella would be the same yeah, thing. Yeah, chondromalacia patella, patella femoral syndrome. Yes, and then they all have, and they'll all be grouped as that common term runner's knee. Yeah, why do we do that? What I don't understand why, <laughs> like why we have so many AKAs. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, uh, it's just I guess it just makes it easy for people to hear it versus chondromalacia patella and they just go oh it's a runner's knee and it's mm -hmm. common and someone branded it and just took off with it but uh wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool if there was the runner's knee trademark term yeah <laughs> i'll have to look <laughs> into that but it's sort of like yeah i have taken it or uh it's too common right now well well so to explain then with so with a quote-unquote runner's knee or that type of symptom pattern mm -hmm. what like what do you usually see like how do these people come in how would someone that's listening to this podcast know if they are experiencing or they should be tuning in right now and thinking about oh i should be listening because this actually is more so what i have okay so uh, for a runner's knee or knee pain in general one of the things that uh when they look up things that i see is one thing is they look up a certain a diagnosis they heard from another friend they google it and dr internet mimics uh, has the symptoms that uh they'll label they go oh that is my pain that's mm -hmm. runner's knee i've got runner's knee and one thing i want the uh i tell my patients and the public to know that just to keep your mind open so yes you may truly have what they are calling it and it may truly be a classic example but there may be other reasons behind it and so when they have a pain underneath their kneecap or in front of their kneecap or the top of their kneecap and it's uh, related to movements or certain activities, particularly like uh, stair climbing, running hills, r descending hills, or what have you. And it acts up uh, to, yes, there's a pain in that knee. And one structure may be involved, a patellar tendon, the tendon, or the cartilage underneath the kneecap, or the meniscus itself. They can all be... Uh, 
the victims, but they may not always be the causes. So people uh, also come in and they say they have runner's knee and they say it's, and my doctor or my, uh, uh, my friend said it's because I have weak or my trainer says it's because I have weak quads and I have an imbalance of tight hamstrings or I have some other uh, condition or it's just because I do it too much. I've been running too much. And then what I try to also tell them is that a lot of times the predictor of a future injury is your background, medical background. So what happened in the past. And so sometimes when the knee is not necessarily the cause of your pain, it may be the victim of your pain, meaning that something else, your, uh, your gimpy hip or uh, a stiff ankle from chronic, uh, chronic ankle sprains or an Achilles tendon surgery on that same leg may actually have been the cause and that is uh, resulting in a knee pain. So what I, the example I'll give is, uh, and I try to explain things as simple as possible uh, because I remember there was a quote by Albert Einstein says, you don't really know something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. So I try to (laughs) say, and just in simple terms were not simple, but just in uh, easy terms where it, that pain in the knee, imagine if someone uh, is bleeding. The problem isn't that they're bleeding, is who shot them. And so sometimes I tell them the sniper is actually your ankle and it's it's shooting at your knee and your knee is suffering. So you're seeing the bleed and you do have to stop the bleed. You do have to control the bleed, but you also have to find out who's shooting the knee. And so a lot of times the knee is a, is a culprit because it's in between your ankle, foot, and it's also in between your hip, pelvis, low back. And so there's a, there, it can be the victim of these other two parties or three parties or whatever the issue is, even your great toe, that can cause your knee to keep re- recurring. The other thing I would say when people say, oh, it's because I've, I've been training for my marathon and that's why my left knee is hurting, that's why I have runner's knee, and I say, well, why is it only your left knee? You know, why, yeah. if you're running, are you only running on your left foot and you're hopping or are you actually running both? So why is your right knee seem to hold on okay, but your left knee seems to always hurt? So I... Uh, oh, it's, so, the, it's the camber in the road. <laughs> exactly. They, they like that one a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm running on the beach and it's at an angle or whatever. Uh, so, um, which, you know, but uh, I try to tell them that there is a reason and when there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or reason, there's always a rhyme, there's always a reason and it's about private investigating and so part of what uh, I believe uh, uh, Dr. Gonzalez and, and I do is we try to find those clues to find out what is really the problem and what is the source of the problem just like uh, CSI looks at blood patterns uh, splatter patterns or this piece of hair or that little uh piece of metal or this bullet shell and they piece it all together to make sense even the most minute details make sense and it comes together uh more cleanly and that's part of our job and for the patients uh look back at your history did you have is your did you always have a uh, left ankle sprain that just didn't heal right it's a little stiff did you have a a prior do you always have your left calf cramp up you know for years or months prior to get starting to have your knee pain things of that nature that really helps give the practitioner clues and even for yourself uh, appreciation and understanding that those things really do make a difference in trying to uh, problem solve what's exactly going on with your knee not only what it's being affected what you know your tendon is inflamed okay but what is actually also causing that to keep coming back or uh, as we try to treat it, uh, to also treat the the sniper as well. I, I see you're finally striking into your own here with the, uh, uh, you were a little concerned about your first podcasting interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to hit my groove. Yeah, right? you're starting to hit it now. Uh, well, you, you present a lot anyway, so you're not, it's like you're, <laughs> we're only talking in front of one person right now. You know me well enough. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, like the, I, I think on another podcast, I said that the knee is the redheaded stepchild of the leg. It's never its fault, but everyone blames it. Mm-hmm. But you always need to look around it, look at the hip and the ankle and the foot and the big toe. I mean, they're so far and extreme. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember I had a patient just about, it was about a month or so ago, and she just could not see, like the first time, I'm sure you do the same thing, like you spend, the, the time explaining to make sure that they are on board with what your ideas of rehab are. Right. So her outlier was some, some hip 
and trunk stuff, it looked really, really sloppy. So mm -hmm. the next time we went into some basic trunk stabilization and she, I could tell she wasn't paying attention. And finally I, I looked at her and I'm like, are you, is everything, are you understanding? She's like, what does this have to do with my, my, my needs again? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay. We're going to spend the whole time here talking this time again. Let's, but they need to understand it, you right. know, to really, to really grasp the treatment plan. Exactly. And, uh, usually what I'll also, uh, and that reminded me of a story. There was a professional, um, fencer. And if you know fencing, they have huge legs because they're always lunging, the lunging motion, they're diving in, lunging, lunging, lunging. And so this guy had, uh, patellofemoral knee pain. And so he was working out hard and he, uh, he could leg, uh, leg curl, uh, or, uh, leg extend, uh, over 300 pounds and he's just going and he's still getting that knee pain when he's doing that lunging when he's doing this uh, and then um, uh, what happened was uh, looked at how how low he could uh, sit without plopping onto the chair and he could not at a certain point he would just plop into the chair and so uh, the cause was that he had a very weak core mm -hmm. and so they could see that because he could not do that and he was He's super strong, built like an ox, had uh, quads, you know, out the wazoo. And then he worked on his core. And so when as he lunged, and only his core, and as he lunged again, his knee pain went away. So mm -hmm. I think there's some buy-in where I will also palpate, uh, feel, look at the medical history, and then uh, see any associated factors that might be underlying. Once they feel how tender it is, and let's just say that they've had a history of a uh, uh, you know, a sciatica or something or, uh, butt uh, shooting pains in their butt. And now they're having the knee pain in the same leg or what have you. Mm -hmm. I'll show them, uh, different areas, uh, and I'll, I'll palpate. And, and if they find an exquisite tenderness or in between their hamstrings where the sciatic nerve, uh, also passes through and say that this is still not resolved, it may have calm down but it didn't really either didn't heal all the way or it's calmed down enough to you don't even notice it as much anymore mm -hmm. but it's still affect it can be still part of the problem so once they feel the difference and i'll go to the other side and go how's that feel and they go i don't feel anything so when they kind of th that helps when with the buy-in and then also as a practitioner the responsibility of actually explaining it clean enough to where they can understand connect the dots and 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 see that for themselves. And say it to their grandma. Yeah, and be able to tell it to grandma <laughs> so the grandma can explain to grandpa what their doctor said about why they're having knee pain. And I think that um, uh, that that helps them a lot to uh, see that. But if they can't see that connection, then, then you're right, that they won't believe in it and they won't buy into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other extreme is you don't want them to... Uh, I've heard that where they go, oh, there's this kinetic chain. Again, they either from a friend or from a colleague or they look up uh, Google research, which I don't mind. You know, I like them to have information, <laughs> as much information on their situation condition, whether it be a, a certain diagnosis or um, or a treatment plan. I, you know, I have no problems with that. But then they'll sometimes the other extreme is they go, oh, I have foot pain and I know it's from my kinetic chain of, you know, going to my right low back uh, quadrant, you know, and they'll just kind of put the dots for you. And it's also, again, sometimes you have to, it may simply just be mm -hmm. something in the foot. You know? Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with the, uh, it's people coming in with a preconceived notion of what they're wanting to get is a little bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I think it takes a little bit of the, the power out of your hands and um, I know that there's been t times where people come in thinking they're going to get one thing and I'll, I'll play the game a little bit in the mm -hmm. beginning where I'm like, okay, I'll let them think that's what we're going to do. Not deceivingly, but kind of like you got to build a little bit of trust and then you got to turn a, a U-turn if you think that's what it's, what their care needs because they're, they're just going to go somewhere else trying to get the wrong thing as well. You know, not doing them any service, any help. Right. Yeah. You don't want to discount what their belief is or what they're coming in with or discount where they got that advice from, from someone that they may have trusted. And I don't, and yes, so I will also respect that and treat that. And then if they, if it plateaus or if it's not getting better, then they tend to be more open with the other possibilities and then going into treating, uh, uh, a different muscle in the in your in your glutes or in your low back, and if that 
uh, creates a change in the pain. Then they start getting their eyes start opening. So mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, a friend of mine from Cirque du Soleil is a Cirque du Soleil PT full time out in Vegas, and the uh, athletes come from all over the world, and so one of them had a severe sprain uh, from in in her left ankle, I believe. And so I was about to put ice, and she said, no, 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 you put an onion on that thing. <laughs> and so he <laughs> didn't know what the, because no, the onion will reduce the swelling. You have to wrap an onion on it. And so he did not want to, I guess, again, get into a fight and also talk about other, but he, what he did was, he said, okay, let's wrap the onion, and then afterwards we'll wrap the ice. Mm -hmm. We'll do both. We'll do both. <laughs> and so she was she was okay with that. And so even though that was, it, it was totally foreign to him, but he respected what she had seen, maybe what they had done back in her home country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but in, I think it was Romania, actually. But And then at the same time, be able to have her buy into uh, doing other types of modalities, including ice. Mm -hmm. to help in the ankle sprain. So I, I try to, uh, kind of like you, where we try to respect that and try to uh, hit certain areas and then at the same time to see if when things plateau or if it's not really changing the symptoms uh, to reassess and then to mm -hmm. try other places and see if that cha makes changes for them. Yeah, one time I actually had to do, there was a guy that was trying to con in to do on goblet squats. Mm -hmm. The only way he would do it is if I would let him bench press <laughs> I said, okay, we'll play this today. He walked in He walked in like the next week and, and he's like, can I bench press again? I'm like, you want a goblet squat again? He's like, no, I don't want to do either. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's jump into then meniscus. And mm -hmm. just for everybody that has doesn't know what the meniscus is, there should be a podcast right before this. I'm trying to line these things up so that I go over anatomy and uh, some of the basic foundational uh, education stuff before we go into theory, but the meniscus is some of the cartilage in the knee which sometimes gets torn or frayed, and so that is a common diagnosis. So, Dr. Co, tell us about meniscus tears and uh, what your experience is anyways. Okay, so there's growing research and studies about uh, meniscus tears in general, and the treatment options the the typical is you have the knee pain you have an mri they show a meniscus tear you have surgery uh, and that's that's and then they'll come in and they'll clean out the meniscus they'll take out any loose bodies and and then you go to physical therapy or rehab and you just and then that is the way to go one thing that people also need to be aware of is after the I believe the age of 40 over 40, 50 percent of people will have asymptomatic uh, meniscus tears. It's just part of the process. Just like many people, if they did an MRI, when they do studies of people with asymptomatic, mm -hmm. no back pain, well, a lot of them will have two millimeter, three millimeter disc bulges, mm -hmm. herniations. With, but they're still playing golf, they're still running, they're still playing, and they've never had a history of back pain. So non non painful meniscus tears. Non painful meniscus tears. And so that being said, so when we talk about, like I said, there's many different causes of your knee pain. And some of it is uh, osteoarthritis, some of it is a certain tendonitis, some of it is uh, a past history causing you to move or run in a certain way that is causing uh, pain or uh, undue uh, strain on certain structures in your knee and those are all true so when you see the pain and then you go right to the MRI uh, there was some that it's not always and I, but I don't want to uh, undermine those facts that you know it's okay to go if you choose to have surgery that is totally fine and there is nothing to uh, say otherwise because you did have an MRI they did go in and there was a definite tear and but it's for those people that don't uh, necessarily feel better mm -hmm. after the fact and they go it's still there i just had meniscus surgery i just you know i'm not sure it's been too much i'm not it's still hurting the same way and so it's not that necessarily the surgeon did a bad surgery it's not uh any of that at all or the pt did a bad rehab it's just that there may be other underlying factors mm -hmm. and so i think there was a study in uh, uh 
Finland, they've done a couple of them. It's difficult with uh, for surgery, but they did a sh uh, two things. One of them was that they did sham surgery uh, on the knee and, and actual meniscus surgery. And the sham surgery, they just did an incision. They didn't do anything, and they sewed it back up. What they found uh, a year later was that the overall performance and uh, pain reduction was similar. Uh, there's no statistical significant difference between the two groups, but there were more side effects from people that actually had meniscus surgery. Mm -hmm. The other thing, um, what they also, again, uh, it is difficult to make those type of studies. It's, it's, it's expensive and risky, but they, uh, what they're trying to show is that, and they also did another where they had one group just do the physical therapy and the other group had the physical therapy and the surgery and one year follow-ups and two year follow-ups found no significant differences in the recovery, uh, overall performance, range of motion, pain levels, uh, so on and so forth between the two. And so there are options where people who do want to avoid surgery, it's not a bad idea to what I call earn your surgery. So where you try the physical therapy, you try a uh, chiropractor, you try uh someone that you trust, a medical professional that you trust in conservative care and see where that goes. If nothing comes of it, then yes, you can, then you've kind of earned your surgery because mm -hmm. you've tried everything else. If you, and even if you go that route, it wasn't a waste of time because I tell people uh, what uh, is also very popular now is prehab. So what you're doing is you're prehabbing your surgery. So uh, the recovery rate is much faster. Mm -hmm. And so when I had a patient with a total hip replacement, he fought it for years. Uh, we were, uh, and we were able to get him to a certain point, but eventually he needed uh, surgery. He was scheduled. We, we worked on him for six to eight weeks prior to, and he had his hip replacement it was successful. And then, uh, when he did his follow-ups, his surgeon told him, he told me just offhandedly, because his surgeon offhandedly just said, you know, in 20 years, you're the fastest person I've ever seen recover from the surgery. I think part of it is him being diligent with his, his home program and, and being diligent with uh, uh, going to rehab, but us at the same time, uh, the prehab cleaning out all the collateral damage that's happening because of his severely arthritic hip getting all that cleaned out, ready to go, so that when he does do surgery, it's, it, it, it's a lot uh, less complications um, from the other surrounding uh, tissues that were damaged leading up to the surgery mm -hmm. that, was able, that enabled him to recover and get to the exercises and strengthen much faster, uh, I believe, than normal. Yeah, yeah. It, they show that people who are who move better and are stronger mm. will recover quicker. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with earning your re or earning your surgery with the rehab. I like the, mm. I like the saying. Um, but I know there's probably a lot of people who think that. Well, so when you said there was that study who, or that showed that surgery and rehab was kind of the same outcome. Mm -hmm. Why not just do the surgery? Like, what is just to play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. why would why would someone want to if they're if they're not opposed to surgery, they're like, mm -hmm. I don't mind getting cut into. Let's mm -hmm. just do this thing. Okay, so that's a good question. So uh, why not just make sure? One thing about surgery is again, there, it's it's surgery, so there's complications, there's a risk of infections, which mm -hmm. I we've both seen. Uh, there's uh, if they've cut too much, if the onset of arthritis is much higher for someone that's had surgery. And even for uh, someone that's had back surgery, the statistics show that it's uh, there's a 10 times higher onset of a second surgery for those who have had uh, back surgery prior, uh, for the first time versus someone that's never had back surgery. And mm -hmm. number two, the onset of arthritis and becoming arthritic is much sooner and faster on average. So now you're putting yourself up. And then also the other thing is surgery... There's, there's only so many tickets you're afford. So if you've already had your first knee surgery, then do you really want to be, then five years later, the knee pain comes back. Do you want to be a two-time offender and get second knee surgery? And then, a, and then another 10 years later, it comes back. You want a third knee surgery? I mean, that's just a lot of surgery on the knee, unless you're a professional athlete and you're getting paid boku bucks for that. Mm -hmm. But there, that is the issue. So you really want to save the surgery, any surgery in general, 
for, you know, you really want to, you don't want to do it more than once. And once you have it once, you're at much higher risk of other side effects. Like, like that study showed that there, or one of the studies shows that, that there was, uh, the only difference was that there was more side effects with people who did have the surgery, uh, the actual surgery where they actually did cut into certain structures. Now, with meniscus tears, it, it's very complicated. They're like uh, snowflakes. Everyone's a little different. So just because someone one had meniscus tear and you have a meniscus tear, where it tore horizontally, vertically, or what have you, or if it uh, if there was a loose body, where it uh, the location of the uh, of some of that debris is makes a world of difference. And sometimes it's just physically caught, and that's why they can't bend their knee a certain to a certain level. Or sometimes it's in a benign area, so you do have a tear. And again, that's why sometimes people who do have the meniscus surgeries and they don't have a, a favorable outcome, maybe that wasn't the main number one cause. Mm-hmm. And so I don't have, again, I don't have a problem when if their surgeon says, here's a meniscus tear, we have an MRI, you match the profile, let's do this relatively easy surgery and let's get that cleaned out and have you have rehab. If you want to go that route, I have no problems with that. I'm not trying to tell you no and that the surgeon doesn't know what he or she is talking about. I am just telling you uh, that there are certain options and the risk, which I would do for anybody, the the risk that I've seen either in the clinic but also uh, in the latest research that I've seen, that to earn your surgery is what I would recommend to my own family members and to save that surgery, if you possibly can avoid it, for when you really absolutely need it, uh, is better for the long game overall, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, is there is there certain types of meniscus? I know there's many different types of meniscus tears, like you mentioned. Is there a type that when you see it on an MRI, you're like, oh, yeah, let's, this is going to be a surgery right here, just because the outcome's really low with, with rehab? Um, you know, that's probably one for that I would probably... Leave for the uh, a surgeon that's seen the MRI, seen, been clinically, uh, have a body of work if they are a knee surgeon, and mm-hmm. then they'll have just they've seen a million MRIs. I haven't seen a million. I've seen some, but I haven't seen a million. So that's I'll leave that. And then they have the eye, the keen eye of seeing exactly uh, those uh, those tears, that location, and then what their background is. So. Uh, one of the things that you also see with the uh, radiologist versus your orthopedic surgeon is the radiologist may have a report of a tear or, or say nothing, but then when you go to certain specialists, they've seen a, like a knee specialist that is respected. They've seen a million knee MRIs more than they've seen maybe a hip MRI, and so they'll be much. They'll have a, on average a much keener eye for certain little things. They'll catch a fracture. They'll catch this. That wasn't, or that they'll say, you know, that's not really a tear. I think that's actually this, and so they'll have a much keener eye. So sometimes you'll see that happen when you go, when you get your radiology report, you see the paperwork, you see what the radiologist says, who sees, you know, all over the body, and then they, you go to a specialist who only sees ninety percent knee MRIs or X-rays. That person will probably, in general, have a keener eye for those things, and then can give you another uh, version of events where they say, you know, it's not that bad, you mm-hmm. know, or, oh, you know what, that, okay, it is torn, but it's not really that bad, you know, or, or, or you know, what? oh, no, 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 <laughs> it's not, it's not that, it's, it's this, and so they will, uh, uh, so <clears throat> just, just a little FYI from what, um, when you see differing opinions, mm-hmm. uh, that's some, so there's some good reasons for that and it has nothing to do with one being competent or being incompetent and that also goes in with a physical therapist when they see the or the chiropractor where they see certain um tests or palpations or their uh, conservative tests over the skin without a, a benefit of an image or an mri image at least that uh they still may have an opinion based on what they're seeing but then again there's a consensus confirmation mm-hmm the old tangent a little bit here um because i wanted to ask then although so we got two different types of conditions here we have mm-hmm. runner's knee and meniscus that we're talking about how how similar when we're, when we're doing physical therapy for it how similar are treatment plans of both 
Are they really <coughs> close? Are they extremely different? Because I know that mm-hmm. a lot of patients, a lot of runners that have these conditions, they probably think, well, I got to have something specific for, you know, the runner's knee or specific mm-hmm. for, men- for meniscus. Mm-hmm. Is what, what do you think about all that? What do you, I'll open it up to you. Okay. So in some ways there's going to be some commonalities, but in some ways there's going to be patient specific. That's why you have to always look at their history. Someone has a history of osteoporosis. Someone has a history of high blood pressure. Someone has a, or taking certain types of medication. Someone has a, um, uh, <clears throat> another condition that limits them from certain exercises and so on and so forth. So you have to do tailor it according to the situation. Someone is having a bad reaction to the surgery, and so their knee is constantly swollen. Someone had an infection. So all those things are uh, are need to be taken into account. So there is, yes, there are some common general themes that we want to accomplish, but also there's also specifics to make them unique. That's why you never want to go to a a place where they just, you go, oh, okay, you had an ACL tear or you had a this meniscus surgery. Here's your exercise program. Go to town, enjoy, and then they just supervise you. And then they do the same thing for every knee patient or every, you know, that hip patient. And that's a red flag in my opinion. There needs to be tailoring. There needs to be some one-on-one. There needs to be some uniqueness to your rehab versus someone else, whether because of the age or because of specific needs you are a high level athlete you are a high level uh avid marathon runner and someone else is an 83 year old uh uh, patient that just wants to be able to walk 30 minutes a day with their husband it's very different so there's uh there's uh, uh activity needs there's uh past histories of uh of multiple back surgeries that you have to take into account so we try to tailor things and that should be uh if you're not getting that unique uh, for you type of situation, then you have to have pause. That, that should not ever be a case where you're in some, uh, maybe on an occasion, but in my opinion, because there's so much individuality and to get the best results for that person in particular, the more individual that you can tailor everything and even modifying the same lunge exercise to strengthen the quad and the glute differently for that patient versus another patient. And um, I think that would be very helpful. So uh, the other thing I would say with, uh, with the surgeries and, in, and to pre- as a preventive, so the second part would also be as a preventive, to look for those other things outside of just rehabbing the knee because you come in with a diagnosis of you know, uh, post-surgical knee menis- meniscectomy, mm-hmm. you know, PT, go ahead and evaluate and treat to look into the causes to really make this the end goal is not that you had successful surgery that's not your goal the end goal is not uh to have that you strengthen your quad the end goal is that you've really uh eliminated the pain and also eliminated any future causes that may contribute to it coming back again and again and again and again the more you can do that and have that a lapse of it never coming back or even if it's going to come back it doesn't come back next to in two months it comes back in two years or five years or what have you mm-hmm. then that the better for you and so i think there's a preventive part that i always try to incorporate to my patients uh, uh rehab to not just get the full range of motion back in the knee and then there's no more pain oh great now go ahead and run no 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 what you know what is the what's going on underneath that uh, would always help the patient, and um, I think it's worth the investment since they're already getting there anyway. And to look at things, and so patients, if you if a certain patient, I tell them you got to look at if there's any asymmetry beyond a uh, ballpark 15% difference in how flexible you are left versus right, how much motion you have in your ankle, your knee, left versus right how much strength you have, left versus right, balance, left versus right, uh, muscle tone. If there's an imbalance over a certain significant where it, it's noticeable, that is a big predictor of some type of future injury uh, to occur uh, because of that asymmetry. So I would also encourage people to, not only as they're rehabbing, make sure that there is a symmetry that, uh, 
that's involved when you, even if you're not injured at all, if you want to prevent things from happening, look at yourself and see if you're noticing, oh yeah, my right shoulder is always a little tighter when I lift it overhead than my left. You may want to look at that because if you can't do that and you're doing overhead presses a lot, you're going to be compensating and twisting things and that can cause future problems. Do you do you have a good, um, I usually ask people for some type of actionable thing someone can do that's listening to the podcast. So it sounds like they can probably measure their asymmetries. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have an easy way to do it for one of the joints, which might, which might be a predictor for a knee condition? Like, is there a certain way that... They can do it right now, listen to the podcast, hopefully they're not in a car or an an airplane. Uh, Yeah, well, there's some simple... Usually the patients will will tell me, because they've had this history, oh, I've never been able to reach, you know, after my shoulder dislocated in high school football, haven't been able to reach overhead, you know, or it still grabs me. Or if they're doing a knee, sometimes I'll just have them do like a deep knee bend, just go all the way down to... uh, And then... Does one feel tighter than the other? Can you and is there a certain pressure? Where is there a certain pain or discomfort? So more often than not, they'll just tell me if it's something obvious, like you know I've never been able to. And I sometimes I have to show them or explain to them the importance of that, and then they'll bring it up because mm-hmm. sometimes they won't. They uh, sh- shoulder uh, sh- someone with uh, shoulder pain uh, with they can't lift their arm up uh, all the way overhead. And then they'll, and they won't mention anything, nothing on our, the medical history or anything they've written down in the questionnaire. And then they'll say at the end of the, oh, by the way, yeah, I did have uh, breast cancer <laughs> and mastec- you know, mastectomy, or I did have a breast, you know, augmentation. And oh, but that's not, that, that has nothing to do with my shoulder. Yes, it does. Yeah, it does. So it definitely has something <laughs> to do with your shoulder. The scar tissue build up, the surgery itself. So there is, uh, so they, uh, so just little things like that will help. But if uh, just yeah, you take your any of your your shoulder, raise it above your head with your elbow straight. Don't you know? Don't let it bend and see if one is if you feel one is looser, more comfortable than the other. Noticeably, that's fine. Oh wait for the, the for the leg for the leg. For, oh yeah, uh, for the leg. <laughs> you got like distracted. Said, deep knee, yeah, like deep knee bend. Uh, you know, I, um, I'll have them sometimes just strain out their leg and push on the top uh, or the. How you, or part of the thigh right above the kneecap, and if there's uh, an over push and pressure and a, a little over pressure, and if there's any pain or if they notice one stays more bent and it's harder to straighten out than the other, uh, that might be an easy check. Okay. It's a good tip. Good tip. Yeah. So people need to start looking for their asymmetries and, mm-hmm. and report them to their therapist mm-hmm. when they go. Yeah. Oh, uh, the other thing you also want to do is when you do like even squats or deep squats, turn your feet out, turn your feet in. Go straight, you know, and just find different angles. Lean on one side or versus the other side. Put your weight on one or the other, and see if there's a a difference that way as well. Do you you guys use the uh, or Trendelenburg test for anything, or like some type of uh, um, finding balance for like the hip or the ankle or anything like that? Yeah, so we'll do a quick assessment of just seeing the balance level, so a single limb balance. Uh, eyes open, how many seconds, eyes closed, mm-hmm. uh, and then take out the uh, the vestibular part or the proprioceptive part or the uh, visual part of balance and just kind of <laughs> tease out and see what one's available. And then we also look at the quality of where they're, uh, what's happening as they're trying to balance on one leg or what have you. Mm-hmm. And so we'll, we will look into that. And then based on what we see on movement analysis or just the the test itself we may go into palpations or ask about any histories of mm-hmm. something that may have contributed to help us with the private investigation. By the way, I don't know if everyone knows, so palpation, we've said that a couple of times, palpation means like touching. Mm-hmm. So kind of like the way we feel uh, muscles or structures. Um, so let me ask you, that. I know that you, uh, you're you an instructor for um, instrument-assisted uh, soft tissue mobilization or I or IAS. T M. Gosh, mm-hmm. it's hard for me. I think I'm dyslexic. Um, <laughs> tell me about tell me about that as well as um, you know, like how you would do, or if there's any certain certain treatments you do, like actually in and around the knee to decrease pain. Because I know mm-hmm. that some people probably tried some of the stuff. Or what's your what are the the top three four that you like to go to? Okay, so the ISM instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. For those that haven't seen it or heard it. It's using metal instruments with a beveled edge to create, to help break up scar tissue 
in a tendon and a ligament in a muscle in your connective tissue like fascia or anything around the nerve and it's just another tool that you can use you can even call a foam roller an instrument assisted soft tissue mobilizer you can also call some of these massage knobby things technically an instrument assisted soft tissue mobilizer You're mobilizing the soft tissues and soft tissues like i said we mean that is skin muscle tendon ligament nerves and connective tissue the uh the the one that uh sebastian was talking about is uh, is a specific set of tools designed to help break up scar tissue designed for soft tissue work specifically the way i got into it was back uh, over 10 years ago i heard about from uh, colleagues that i totally respected one of the colleagues but these instruments back then and they even now were about over three thousand dollars so they were quite cost prohibitive i didn't know if that was even worth the investment you had to you had to buy pay that amount just to take their course didn't you oh yeah you have to take a course so you have to take a level one i think is 750 or 600 750 without the instruments and then you take another course to be a certified provider and it's another about 700 750 and then so that's already about 1500 dollars plus the time of travel and other things and then you have the right to buy the instruments themselves which are about three thousand dollars so back then that was a that was a big investment for me and so i called up one of the one of my colleagues His name was mark file and if you google him he was the former uh, uh athletic trainer of the year for in the nba he was the head trainer for the chicago bulls and when michael jordan was playing and during the heyday and so i called him up and i said hey you know mark uh, do you use these tools a lot i mean these instruments and he goes oh yeah all the time i go really i mean are they really making a difference in your athletes versus your your hands which we always use and uh, he goes let me tell you something michael jordan just called me three weeks ago and he told me that these are the only things that saved his knees throughout his career so i don't know what else to tell you and um so that kind of that and a couple other people talking about it uh, spurred me on to go ahead and make the investment, see if I can bring uh, faster change, better changes, uh, more efficient changes in less time and in a better way for my patients outside of what I was already doing. When I went to the uh, Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs uh, before the Beijing Olympics, I noticed they had stacks, about 12 stacks of these instruments. And to my, uh, in my experience, I have not met working with Major League Baseball, professional volleyball, NFL, uh, NBA, Division One, NCAA. I have yet to have met an athlete in the pro Olympic level who has not either has had it done to them or has at least heard about it. There's not a single person yet that I've ever met that said, "What is that? I've never heard of that." It's, it's not, and if you look, Kobe Bryant's PT, uh, we'll talk about it. He's talked about it. Michael Phelps, he's talked about it, getting it done to him. Uh, and so it's it's been around for a, a little over 20 years, and it's growing considerably um, in, uh, in popularity. And the thing that I want to caution people is make sure you go to a certified ISTM provider or practitioner or someone who has taken the courses because there are these are stainless steel surgical grade or they should be surgical grade uh, instruments and they are going to be working on areas of uh, your pain your tendonitis your areas of ideally that are have scar tissue and are injured so you want to make sure someone is not putting too much pressure going too long too hard too fast too strong um, with these instruments because they can cause quite a bit of pain and um, in my in my recent uh, last few years uh, the last seven years I've been a contracted expert witness for the US government and the US Department of Health uh, testifying in federal court on uh, Medicare and other physical th therapy related cases and I'm also noticing uh, more and more cases of uh, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization um, practitioners and patients inquiring because they were used by people that weren't certified uh, maybe their 
their boss was certified and they were just using the instruments or they just grabbed some instruments that they bought over on Amazon and just went to town. And so I'm hearing more and more of these cases as the popularity is growing within the um, uh, within the uh, PT, ATC, or athletic trainer, chiropractic community. And so I do want to caution patients to make sure that 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 you do go to someone that's a, a certified provider and make sure the instruments are not plastic or made of bone or cheap aluminum metal because the, the reason why is the bacteria, the porosity of some of those materials can collect uh, bacteria over time and you can imagine they're scraping on dozens and dozens of patients and then they come to you. And so you want to make sure that the, the um, things of that is surgical grade, has a mirrored finish, those things were... Uh, at least in that, in terms of cross-contamination is covered, but then also make sure that the operator, the guy who's holding the instrument itself, is also well-qualified and has the uh, instructions to understand uh, how to use it uh, properly to keep you safe and also to prevent him from uh, causing, or her, causing more problems to you. Mm -hmm. Well, you, with the with some of the instruments assisted, there'll be, there'll be some... It's not bruising. There's a. Is there bleeding? Is there a little bit of bleeding? Uh, mainly the bruising. And so, what the uh, bruising, what you'll uh, forewarn the patients that that is a, f a common phenomenon. The way the instruments and the original patent was on the bevel edge, uh, uh, creating a certain friction over areas of scar tissue in general. So, what will happen is if they go over an area, the operator the goes over an area and there's no scar tissue. It'll just feel like metal sliding on your skin. And there might be a light, very, very light pink, but almost nothing. The other th time is when it goes over scar tissue, number one, the patients will also feel like, oh, my gosh, that's it. And even if it's the same pressure, the same, like if they're going over someone's lats or muscles or their tricep muscles, and they go over a certain area and it's nothing, and then certain areas it'll just be super sensitive and they'll feel that. What may also happen is that that area uh, idea, uh, most likely will have an area of uh, scar tissue co contributing to their pain or sensitivity. Scar tissue has uh, very weak blood vessels. The blood vessels within scar tissue are very thin-walled. The blood vessels in a healthy muscle tissue, for example, are thicker walled. So when someone, so you imagine... There's an area of scar tissue on their thigh or their thigh muscle, and the, the instruments are going over part of the thigh that has no problems. That's fine. And then they go to an area where there's some scar tissue where there may have been damage, a strain, or a mild tear, and that's causing their pain in their quads. Then the scar tissue over that area will be the one that's sensitive. The scar tissue, as you're breaking it up, has a thinner walled uh, 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 blood vessel, so they will break easier as it's being having a friction massage through the instruments. And so that will create a phenomenon called petechiae. And that phenomenon will look like a, uh, like a bruising, uh, um, a hickey or what have you, or maybe <laughs> depending on the patient's skin color, tone or color. And you just want to be cognizant of that, tell them it's not unusual. And there'll be also some of the other things that they'll notice is a tenderness to touch to the skin. And so you just remind them uh, if it's tender to touch in the next few days versus tender to movement. If it's just tender to touch, like, oh, I put on my slim fit shirt and it, it's really sensitive or something, or their skinny fit jeans and it's rubbing on that thigh that you just worked on. Yeah, they'll have tenderness, but not to worry about the tenderness. It's like, and I'll ask patients, well, are you moving better? Is it is it less? Yeah, it's less painful when I move, but it's really tender where... Yeah, tender to touch is no problem. Tender to movement is the problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will tell them to make sure you understand the difference. And eventually, like some of these other Olympic athletes or pro athletes, they, you do build up a tolerance over time, so it's not as big of a deal, or they know the, they know the game, and they're much more aware of that. Mm -hmm. But again, that does lead to if you're not uh, – haven't gone through courses, have it done to themselves, the person, the doctor, having it done to themselves – getting feedback, getting the learning and the education and who to avoid doing it and where to avoid doing it. So not every area is ideal for this instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization technique. Uh, if they don't have that understanding or learning, then they can be putting somebody or an area that they shouldn't be at at all 
at risk. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how, how would we find someone who is certified? Okay, so there's different um, there's different websites. There's one I think there's called istmexpert.com. There's also uh, certain brands will have their own educational component. One is fibroblaster. Uh, dot com. There's some other ones like Graston.com. Um, and so you can look at these other groups, look at what they're learning, uh, their, their courses entail, look at they even require courses. The ones that really don't require courses are just kind of selling it to anyone and anybody, regardless of if they're even a health licensed practitioner, mm -hmm. uh, you may want to shy away from. You also want to shy away from places that don't have any educational component because, I mean, they haven't vetted that through. So that's another red flag. You also want to look at, uh, you can ask, inquire if you're looking at certain instruments, if you're a practitioner, but if you're a patient, uh, what is the materials that they're using? And there is a different uh, reason why some materials or some instruments are only 50 bucks on Amazon and some of them are $3,000. And there, uh, and there's reasons why. So the first thing I got certified in was Graston because that, uh, the Graston Technique was the first company to have a patent on this type of technology and using these uh, surgical grade steel instruments for the purpose of soft tissue mobilization treatments. And uh, since their patent expired, about 50 or 60 different companies blew up. It's international. When I go traveling with the uh, different Olympic, team, Olympic teams uh, for world championships or, or what have you, they, uh, Team Finland, Team Netherlands, Team Russia, they all have, Team Great Britain have instrument assisted soft tissue uh, mobilization uh, instruments that they use. Uh, so uh, it's not only national, but it's international. So I don't want people to think it's just something new that is out there just the last few years. It's been around for over 20 years. But as mm -hmm. one of my friends from... Uh, who's a professor at University of Miami Physical Therapy School um, and at USC said that uh, by the time anything cutting edge has has gone through its f full body of work and research and studies, it's already 30 years too old. Mm -hmm. And so there is an importance of having the research and making sure we understand its place and its effectiveness within the... Um, uh, healthcare community, but also uh, some of these things that you see. Uh, you don't want something that's only a year or two old, but you do want something that's proved itself over the test of time. And again, these instruments have been around for about 20 years, and it's only grown in popularity. And that's why professional athletes who are worth over 100, 200 million dollars are willing to go through those type of treatments, which are not always pleasant. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> if they're willing to do that, it, uh, and there's other than that may uh, 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 come about. And I'm seeing more and more invitations to speak at different physical therapy schools and chiropractic colleges, actually, uh, on instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization. And it's coming into the academia more and more and more and more research is coming out. So I'm excited to see more mm -hmm. about that. I thought it was funny when I went through school, like the, actually our, our physiotherapy uh, mm -hmm. class, I think we had, we had diathermies in there. Mm -hmm. I, I've never, I've never seen a diatherm <laughs> in, in real life other than school. So you're right. Like the stuff that they seem to teach are like they're borderline or, or archaic. And then I think they're just barely now teaching how movement's important and instrument assisted. Right. And right. so it's funny. They have to get all that education later after they get out of school a lot of times. Right. And again, I don't want to poo-poo people in academia or poo-poo evidence-based research. That's it's a it's a it's important necessity. We want to know what certain instruments or certain uh, modalities like an ultrasound or a diathermy machine does for the patients and in its proper place and what it's actually doing. So that's all very very important, but you can't be cutting edge and uh, completely it it just it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's why a lot of you'll notice a lot of other things like PRP and uh, injections, which are now very popular, they, that were that was in Europe and Canada and other places outside of U.S. because of the FDA and other things that uh, that was already going on, and that's why Kobe Bryant and all these people would travel to Germany to find these people that have been doing it for a lot longer than some of the people here in the United States. So that's just an example of something that's cutting edge that's trying to. Uh, 
gain, you know, headway. And now it's it's in many, many well-qualified surgeons in the U.S. and other practitioners, uh, osteopaths or, or what have you are, are um, performing PRP mm-hmm. and stem cell injections. Yeah, it takes, it's, I've, I still have a lot of patients now that I've kind of like dropped a little bit of, you know, like, hey, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, ne- never. I'm like, really? Like, it's, it's kind of older now. Like, mm-hmm. actually, I did a I did a podcast about um, probably about five to six sessions ago with uh, a stem cell doctor. Um, it was enlightening. Actually, I went to his office and, and saw that uh, all the procedures and everything. Uh-huh. I'd never seen it all in person, but it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. And even that, there's all the details about how they collect the uh, the, the growth factors from the platelet-rich plasma from the period. There's all, so again, it's not about finding the bargain basement price. There are certain issues of how they're collecting it, who's been doing it, how long they've been doing it. That makes a difference. So it's, it's good to do the research. Mm-hmm. So. We're coming up on, I think we're about 50 minutes. This might be the second longest podcast yet. Um, <laughs> is there anything you would like to finish with? Or I know that we got to figure out how to reach you in your office. And um, Yeah, well, uh, my, uh, I have two locations, Tustin and in, uh, in Irvine. Irvine is our main location. It's in the Irvine Spectrum area for people who live in Orange County. Uh, and... California, by the way. California. <laughs> and you can go to the website, www.kohpt.com. And it also has some information on some of the things that we did talk about and some of the techniques being utilized, including IASTM, to give you some uh, background information. But again, I encourage, I encourage the research, uh, knowing what you're getting into, understanding uh, the problems, but also appreciate that there are uh, many different ways to treat and also getting as many different ways that are tried and true uh, is is nice because your hands may not be as good as your as the instruments for a particular problem for a particular patient and vice versa but having the option to is is nice and then also to uh, be open to hearing uh, some other possibilities beyond what uh, may be internet search to see, or from what you've heard from other people, to appreciate the individuality of your own meniscus injury or your knee pain, and to appreciate that as well, that every person is going to be a little bit different with the exact same diagnosis, exact same surgery, or exact same pain, will have different uh, unique uh, aspects and causes, and to uh, embrace your individuality and make sure the practitioner embraces your individuality and doesn't put you on some recipe that's good for anybody. Mm-hmm. And also to recap, look look for the sniper, not the bullet hole. Yeah, exactly. Don't look at the victim. <laughs> look at who's shooting the victim. <laughs> well, cool. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I know that uh, you're a busy, busy guy, and it's hard to get you when you're in town. But um, thanks for coming on. I'll close the podcast now. I appreciate it. Well, cool. So everybody, again, if you would like to get a hold of Dr. Ko, his website is 3 W's and kohpt.com. Uh, again, if you want to reach me at all and ask questions or suggest providers um, that I would like that you'd like me to interview and ask the questions that you might not have gotten to at your doctor's appointment, just go to uh, P2. That's P the letter to the number sportscare.com, and I will answer any questions you have. There is a button right there there on the page, which is a voicemail button. You don't need a phone. You don't need anything. Just speak right to your computer, send it, and I will get it and answer the best ones so again p2sportscare.com don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends it helps me out a ton and please if you would write me a comment on itunes it would be absolutely amazing so i will speak with you guys soon and have a good one